Hello, my name is David Bishop, and this lecture will focus on the anesthetic management uh, of obstetric hemorrhage and will largely deal with the perioperative implications. The lecture will assume that the normal aspects of anesthetic pre-op evaluation and theatre preparation have already been dealt with, and it will also aim to be consistent with the obstetric version of this talk, which was given by Professor Sue Forkers. Now, obstetric hemorrhage is common. It's a major cause cause of death in South Africa and it should be something to prepare for at every seizure. It's going to happen at some point that you must deal with a bleeding perioperative caesarean section patient. It may be unexpected and it can happen with astonishing rapidity. One in five deaths in South Africa occur from obstetric hemorrhage. One in three of these are related to caesarean section and a third of them occur during seizure but two-thirds after seizure. And this is therefore a common uh, issue that you will need to deal with. So this is just one approach that you can take. Uh, evaluate the patient of, uh, for risk of bleeding before that bleeding occurs, and you should do this in every patient. Take steps to minimize the impact of bleeding if and when it occurs. Diagnose the bleeding early and communicate this well to the perioperative team. Manage the bleeding effectively, think carefully before discharging from recovery, and consider the patient at high risk of complications uh, and review that patient until hospital discharge. And we're going to go through each of these points in more detail. There are some questions you should ask before every seizure that you perform, particularly if you're working at district hospital setting. There is often no option but to proceed, but it's worth assessing this anyway. And if, even if you don't have a choice, you can get advice and discuss referral before you get into trouble. So ask yourselves, are we in the right location? Are we doing the CESA for the right reasons? Do we have the right people? And by right people, I mean the most experienced or skilled uh, doctors in the hospital and nurses. Are they in the theater for the high-risk patient? And do we have the right resources available to deal with the potential complications? You need to know how to ask for help. This means knowing your referral hospital, developing a relationship with both the obstetric and the anesthetic departments. Clarify how referrals should occur and the best way to do this, especially after hours. And have this referral mechanism displayed somewhere in the theater complex so that it's efficient and easy when you need to do it. Now it's important to specifically ask whether the patient booked for caesarean section is at increased risk of perioperative bleeding. So evaluate this risk before it occurs. This means reading the patient's file before you start, asking what the risk factors are for bleeding, checking whether the patient's anemic. Ideally we treat this at antenatal level in the clinics, but if the patient comes anemic to theatre, they're at increased risk for bleeding and looking at the staff competencies you have available. Have your experienced, skilled people in the room for high-risk patients. Now the risk factors for um, perioperative bleeding, this is a table from the New England Journal of Medicine and it gives some indication. This table is also in your notes. And some of these risk factors are also on the obstetric version of the WHO surgical safety checklist. Take this step seriously. Predicting who's gonna bleed and preparing for it is absolutely critical and it really can help in the management of these patients. Now, when bleeding occurs, um, it's hard to then get set up. So it's ideal that you take steps to minimize the impact of bleeding before it occurs so that when it happens, uh, you're in control. Firstly, think what is the right anesthetic to give before you start. If the patient's already bleeding, or has got a high likelihood of bleeding, a GA is probably the right way to go. Give a general anesthetic if you have the skill set. If the patient might bleed or is not bleeding, then a spinal may well be appropriate, and we know that it's the safer anesthetic to give if the patient doesn't bleed in most cases. Be guided by clinical clues, particularly the heart rate and the blood pressure, but also look at things like the capillary filling. Is the SATS uh, monitor giving a reading? And what is the shock index? Now the shock index looks at heart rate and blood pressure. If the heart rate is above the blood pressure, be worried. Think about a general anesthetic and think about further resuscitation. If the heart rate is under 100, it's usually okay to go ahead with the spinal. 
above 120, you should think very, very carefully before proceeding with a spinal anesthetic. Many of these patients require general anesthetics. And then set up for intraoperative bleeding, particularly in the high-risk patient. That means a good large bore IV line, at least a gray, sometimes two. Get the monitors on. React to what the monitor is telling you early. Get access to blood products, appropriate ut utrotonics. Try and control the theater temperature. Use a forced air warmer and IV uh, fluids that have been warmed in every patient if you can, but particularly in the bleeding patient. If you have cell salvage, have it in the room. Try to know how to operate it before um, you need to suddenly operate it. They're complex machines. And get your most skilled team into theater if you can. Now this is the current version of the algorithm for bleeding at cesarean section, which should be displayed on theater walls so you don't have to memorize it. But importantly, look at how the diagnosis is made. Uh, the anesthetist may play a key role here. So a low blood pressure in combination with an increased heart rate should prompt a team discussion about the possibility of bleeding. And that is enough to give tranexamic acid in some cases. So that early diagnosis is very key uh, to effective management. Um, so we've discussed the diagnosis. Just remember that the resuscitation often requires a second line. You need to give fluids, crystalloids, maybe colloids and blood products. Run an oxytocin infusion, uh, 20 units in one liter and run it as an infusion. Infusions generally have less hemodynamic impact than uh, bolus doses. So um, these patients often do require oxytocin, but try and give it as an infusion rather than boluses. And remember your tranexamic acid. Uh, which should be given on diagnosis of obstetric hemorrhage. Visual estimation of blood loss is a key component to diagnosis, and the amount of blood contained in soaked surgical swabs is often underestimated. So it's worth displaying a chart like this in your theater complexes, um, and then you, you'll be able to tell how much each sized surgical swab will, con will contain when it's soaked. Now, uh, managing the bleeding effectively um, requires that you know how to treat uterine atony, and that's usually with oxytocin infusions. You may need to add ergometrine, which is a relative contraindication in the cardiac or the hypertensive. You can repeat your tranexamic acid once. Uh, misoprostol 400 to 600 mics sublingually, um, and then surgical measures like uterine compression, balloon tamponade, and even subtotal hysterectomy. When you're doing the hemostatic resuscitation, um, remember that if you get in early, it's often a better way to, pre uh, to prevent coagulopathy occurring. The, the timing of the coagulopathy often depends on the cause. So when you're dealing with trauma, like a uterine tear or uterine rupture, or uterine atony, then the coagulopathy usually develops late, uh, after three or four liters of blood loss. And so then you should start with fluids and red cells. If the hemorrhage is due to an inherent problem with thrombin, so there's a coagulopathy already, or it's one of the tissue causes like placental abruption or placenta previa, then the coagulopathy develops very early. And the early use of FTP, platelets, and cryoprecipitate should be prioritized. Remember general measures like regularly checking hemoglobin and coagulation status if you can, check the clinical response, and keep the patient warm. Remember not to extubate patients that require ongoing resuscitation or are still inotrope dependent or severely acidotic. Um, and at this point, you'll need to discuss with an expert at your referral hospital prior to proceeding. So the right anesthetic for the situation is that you may need to use lower doses to reduce um, instability. Using half the regular dose or even a quarter in critically unstable patients is, is usually advised. Remember to titrate. Hypotensive patients generally need fluids. So if you're not sure, the, the default is probably to give the fluid in the hemorrhaging patient. Consider converting spinal anesthesia to general anesthesia, but prepare for hypotension. Patients with functional spinal anesthetics will have more hypotension than those without. So you, you need an inotrope ready uh, in the form of ephedrine or adrenaline. If you are going to intubate intraoperatively, these are high risk intubations. So prepare well, make sure that you have access to the airway the screen and the positioning of the patient are problems with intubation intraoperatively, and you really need to prepare well for them and discuss this with your team.
If you need an inotrop, the inotrop of choice would be either ephedrine or adrenaline as a default, not phenylephrine. Phenylephrine is specifically indicated for vasodilatation due to spinal anesthesia. In most other settings, you should lean towards ephedrine and adrenaline, which give you better um, pharmacological responses in the setting of hemorrhage. Um, remember that as your patient starts to recover from the resuscitation, as you get the fluids in, in and the blood in, they may now need higher doses of anesthetic to remain asleep. So this remains a titration. Titration to effect remains a key principle with fluids and with drugs. And then finally, don't close the abdomen if the patient is hypotensive. The systolic blood pressure needs to be over 100 when you're closing the abdomen. And this, be this is because bleeding is often concealed if the patient's hypotensive. Value the recovery period. It's often the last time that intensive monitoring can be done. And be sure that patients are stable prior to discharge from the ward, to the ward. So look at heart rates, oxygen saturation and blood pressure. They should be near normal. Make sure you've, it's been at least 20 minutes since you last intervened either with an inotrope or a fluid bolus. Measure every five minutes for up to an hour until you feel the patient is stable and try and get heart rates below 110, systolic blood pressures over 100. Make sure bleeding, pain, temperature, and nausea and vomiting are controlled. And if it's a general anesthesia, make sure the patient's awake and has normal power. And in the spinal, that the level of the block is decreasing, they can move their legs, or that you've measured it below T10. Consider the patients you're discharging to the ward that are at higher risk of complications and continue to watch them until hospital discharge. So document well. Um, this often triggers thoughts in your mind about who's high risk. The assessment of blood loss is important because patients who've had massive obstetric hemorrhage uh, tend to uh, be at increased risk to post-operative hemorrhage. Describe what difficulty, difficulties you had. Write up oxytocin infusions in one liter um, uh, intravenous fluid for the first eight hours and go and check that that infusion is running in the ward. Uh, if you've got a high care or you're able to refer, this is something you should consider after massive blood loss. So discuss this with the senior or your referral center and review regularly. Regular scheduled review is absolutely critical to the early detection of post-operative complications, especially bleeding. So try and schedule these visits if you can. Just go past the patient, check their heart rate and blood pressure. We do have an early warning chart. This is useful, but there's so many fields that you might not be called reliably. Uh, so regular review is the best way um, to pick up patients early. Early diagnosis of postpartum hemorrhage uh, is vital. Remember that two-thirds of bleeding deaths occur after season, not during. And again, within that uh, algorithm, the diagnosis is made by uh, excessive PV bleeding, which is something that is relatively easy to detect, but also a decrease in blood pressure and an increase in heart rate. And so that inversion where the blood pressure is dropping and the heart rate is going up, especially if it's combined with clinical signs, is something to take very seriously. So in summary, bleeding from caesarean section is a serious preventable cause of death in South Africa. We must learn to predict it well and prepare well for it. Aim for having the correct team in the correct location with the correct resources. Recognize excessive blood loss early, react quickly, be calm, and have a plan if there's heavy bleeding, and then ensure post-operative vigilance and an early response. And if you do these things correctly and consistently and you do them and think about them every time you do a CSER, uh, this is something that we can prevent and make a serious impact on uh, morbidity and mortality in the obstetric field in South Africa. Thank you.